Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Well, uh, before we do get started, I do want to uh, encourage you to nominate the show at podcastawards.com. We're running in the entertainment category. Also, if you have any other favorite podcasts, be sure to put them in for nomination as well. You can only nominate us once in this round, but uh, we'll let you know when, if we uh, make it to uh, as a finalist. Uh, your support's definitely appreciated. All right, well, now Michael Shane gets very uh, different. The Lloyd Nolan films were a success and were enjoyable to watch. And the Wally Mayer radio series did fairly well, continuing on the air for a couple of years. However, it's fair to say that both series, the film and the radio, were very different from the book. Michael Shane was really from a hard-boiled uh, private eye in the novels. Not the uh, charmingly lovable uh, character Lloyd Nolan portrayed, nor was he the great deductive brain that we heard in so many of the Wally Mare series. All of those programs uh, were good for what they were, but didn't really play into what Michael Shane uh, was often about. I'm not certain that this series does either, but it certainly plays to a different aspect of the character. The New Adventures of Michael Shane was produced as a syndicated radio program. It was uh, directed by William Rousseau, who also uh, directed uh, CBS's uh, revisions of uh, Pat Novak for Hire. However, these are a little less um, humorous than the uh, Novak strip, so they, though uh, my, the New Adventures of Michael Shane definitely does have uh, its moments. One big thing where it's definitely not true to the book is that while uh, Michael Shane's adventures were set in Miami, uh, in the books, his adventures in the new adventures of Michael Shane actually occur in New Orleans. However, this may be true to the inspiration for Michael Shane. I I mentioned uh, several months back when we first started the series that Brett Halliday had been inspired with the creation of Michael Shane by seeing a uh, tough uh, character sat calmly through a ballroom uh, brawl and finished his cognac before joining the fight. Well, that incident actually occurred in New Orleans. Plus, as we've referenced before, New Orleans uh, is a city filled with great mystery. And uh, that aura of mystery was very strong during the golden age of radio. Rousseau landed uh, Jeff Chandler to play the role of Michael Shane. Chandler was just a a couple years away from uh, the real stardom he would achieve in the 1950s. He got the role of Cochise in Broken Arrow. And the cast is filled with uh, actors who we have heard in other uh, Bill Rousseau shows, including Pat Novak for Hire, and uh, The Amazing Mr. Malone. When it comes to original air dates, that's really hard. This was a syndicated series, so different stations aired it at different times. In addition, uh, this is not a series that was always aired in strict uh, order, so it's hard to know in what order these should be arranged. Uh, For listening enjoyment, it doesn't really uh, matter. But for the duration of this series, we'll just stick to the fact that uh, these episodes aired sometime in 1948 or 1949 uh, originally. And I'll be playing these episodes in the order of their uh, uh, publication based on the uh, discs that have been documented on RadioGoldIndex.com. 
In the event I cannot find a uh, record for a particular episode, like I think uh, there... With that said, uh, this has been a long introduction, but uh, this is certainly a, a very interesting series, and we'll have more to say about the stars uh, later. Uh, but uh, now it's time for today's episode of The New Adventures of Michael Shane, uh, and the title is The Man Who Lived Forever. <laughs> Look, doll girl, I've got to know what goes. Last night, someone ran me down. Later on, they killed an old man who tried to tell me something. My nerves are like radar, and they're sending out all kinds of danger signals. I'm on somebody's list. Whose list, doll girl? Come on, give! The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back in his old haunts in New Orleans, ready as always to risk his neck for law, order, and an occasional dollar. Listen now as we bring you The New Adventures of Michael Shane. Hello. Michael Shane, private detective. Speaking. Mr. Shane, I have a job for you, but I can't pay you very much. Keep talking, I'm listening. My name is Marina LaRue. I want you to come over to 1612 Wentworth Street. I meet you on the porch. On the porch? Yes, this is why I call you. My father has locked all the doors and windows. He's in the house, sitting in the dark, waiting. Waiting for what? For death, Mr. Shane. Now we return to New Orleans and a new adventure with Michael Shane. So I was on my way across New Orleans to see Marina LaRue, whose papa was waiting for death. The 1612 Wentworth Street was a couple of minutes by cab in ordinary times, but these were not ordinary times, so it was taking me a half hour to walk it. Yeah, yeah this had been a bad month for little Mike. Police headquarters had suspended my license for 60 days for being a stunk. But even stunks have stomachs and creditors. And that last buck in my wallet was so lonely it was getting psychoneurotic. So, license or no license, I wasn't letting Marina LaRue get away. And just like she said, she was waiting on the porch and she was some baby doll. Creole from way back and round and ripe like a cantaloupe busting its seams. Only I'd been living on shredded wheat and canned milk for so long, all Marina LaRue meant to me then was ham and eggs and pork chops and maybe pie a la mode. Mr. Shane. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm half out of my mind. I don't want to call the police if nothing is really wrong. Hey, hey, I... slow down, slow down. You, your father's inside the house? Yes. He has been in there for the last eight days, just sitting in his room in the dark. Like I said, waiting for death. What's the matter? Is he sick? No. He's as healthy as you or I. That's why I don't understand. Tonight, he won't even let me in the house. He has locked all the doors and the windows. I, I don't know what to think. Well, I think we ought to tap a brick against one of those windows and have a talk with Papa. Yes. Yeah, but first I ought to tell you that I... I break windows and talk to Papas who wait for death for something more than the sheer joy of it. For something like 20 bucks a day. You, uh, you understand that, of course. I told you I'd pay you! Okay. I always like to begin business on a friendly basis. Now, oh, where's that brick? I broke the window, reached in and unlocked it, and then slid over the sill. The house was as black as a mug of G.I. coffee. I found a light switch and clicked it back and forth, but nothing happened. And I let the girl in through the front door. Come on in. What happened to the lights? I don't know. And where is Papa? Yeah. Papa! Papa! I started lighting matches, and we wandered through the house. Papa! A single flare of light cast crazy shadows against the walls and the ceiling. Papa! You got the screwy feeling that the house itself was alive and watching you. Except for our footsteps, there wasn't a sound. Papa, where are you? Oh, my error. Yeah, yeah, there was a sound, all right, coming from the next room down the hall. I felt a nerve deep down inside me start jangling like a burglar alarm. Papa! I knew that sound like I know my heartbeat. We were at the door of the room. I struck another match and the girl saw. Papa! No. No, Papa! 
looked like a pig in a butcher shop, tied to the chandelier. His head lolled on her shoulder and his eyes stared up into nothing at all. Then suddenly the girl's sobbing ended as though somebody had clamped a hand over her mouth. When she spoke, she sounded like a stranger. Strike another match. A little close to him. Wasn't one look enough? Strike the match. Okay. His forehead. Yeah. yeah. Funny, Mark. Looks like a brand or something, a coiled snake. I should have known. I should have known that's why he was so frightened. That is who he was waiting for. Anthony Kyle. Hey, 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 kid, snap out of it. Hey, what's wrong with you? What are you talking about? Who's Carell? Kyle? I didn't say. I didn't. I didn't hey, say hey, that. hey, hey. Call the police. Tell them. My father committed suicide. And then go away. I did what the lady said. I called the cops, collected my 20 bucks, and beat it. Because if the police found me working without a license, they might send me to bed without supper. With 20 bucks, I was once again a man of distinction. So I took a cab downtown. On the way, I debated whether to sample Antoine's elegant crawfish or... Galatoire's savory bouillabaisse. Yeah, I settled for Charlie's hash and beer. Charlie was an ancient, moth-eaten character who kept a basement bar on Beale Street just so he'd have somebody to talk to. And there weren't many customers tonight, and he stayed close to me, polishing the mahogany and looking annoyed. New Orleans, how quaint. Huh? Yeah, that's what they said, how quaint. What are you talking about, Charlie? Tourists, I'm talking about six of them. Came down a while back from Peoria, they said. Just looking, they said. How quaint. All right, quaint pour me they... another one, Charlie. Yeah, okay, okay, Mike. Uh, quaint, they think this is. I should have told them how my place used to be. But the cockfights we had right there in the center of the floor by candlelight. And the 12 ladies from Natchez doing the can-can. Peoria. Charlie. Huh? Did you ever hear of anyone named Anthony Carell? Charlie, I'm talking to you. I heard you, Sheen. Well? You better stick to looking through hotel transoms and forget Anthony Carell. Why? Because it's something out of the past. Something that hasn't got any place in this world. What are you talking about? You see, according to the story, there's something special about Anthony Carell. Special? Yeah. He ain't like you and me, Sheen. You see, Anthony Carell ain't never gonna die. That tickled me. (laughs) Oh, I finished my drink, waved goodbye to old Charlie, yelled something about getting Carell's formula and putting Perona out of business, and then I was on my way. The air was better outside, and I decided to walk. It was a nice, quiet street. Great place to start a cemetery. As it turned out, I was just the kid to start one. I didn't hear the car behind me. All I saw was the cab on the next corner. Cab driver was leaning against the open door waiting for me. I stepped off the curb and a couple of heads. Hey, look out! Then I was rolling on cobblestones, watching a red tail light disappear in the distance. Next thing, the, the cab driver was bending over me. You okay, Pally? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess so. Hey, take me home, will you? That sure was close. No, no, I, I just got careless crossing the street. Careless? <laughs> I was watching, Pally. That car followed you for maybe two blocks, waiting to get a chance at you. Huh? Yeah. Somebody in this town don't like you very much, Pally. The cabbie drove Pally home. Between my evening of hilarity and my nosedive in the gutter, I felt kind of rocky. As soon as I got in the room, I flopped down in bed and bid the world good night. But the world wasn't finished with me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Mike, this is Charlie. Oh, yeah, Charlie. Listen to me, boy. Something funny's going on. Yeah, yeah, funny. They're trying to scare me. But old Charlie's been around too long to scare. Oh, good for old Charlie. You come on over now. I'll tell you what they're up to, boy. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, you sure. come on over right away. Okay, okay. You know where I bunk? In the room behind the bar. Just knock on the front door. Uh-huh. I'll let you in. Yeah. Get yeah. here quick as you can. Sure, sure. 
Sure, Charlie. Sure. The last thing I saw before I fell asleep again was a luminous green dial on my bedside clock. 3.47. It said 10.20 when I saw it again. The room was lousy with sunshine. I was brushing my teeth and trying to avoid my reflection in the mirror when I remember Charlie calling me. I found the phone number of his joint in the book and I called him. Only it wasn't Charlie who answered. Yeah? I want to speak to Charlie. Who is this? Uh, just let me talk to Charlie. Sorry, mister. Charlie isn't here. Well, where is he? They took him to the morgue an hour ago. He's dead. Now, back to New Orleans to the new adventures of Michael Shane. From the beginning, it hadn't made much sense. Marina LaRue calling me to break into her father's house. Him hanging from the chandelier with a snake brand on his forehead. And now, old Charlie dead. Well, I, I went down to the morgue. The attendant took me to the basement to where Charlie was on a table. Lieutenant Burns of headquarters was just taking a peek. Nasty, a redhead. Yeah. Yeah, neck's a bum sheep for a butcher knife. What's that on his forehead? Hmm? Looks like a brand, like a coiled snake. I probably banged his head. It's nothing. Now, you want to bet, Lieutenant? Say, look, Shane, what are you doing around here? You're not forgetting that your license is suspended. Oh, a guy can get in here without a license? Look at Charlie. All he had was a license to sell bad booze. You're not doing any work for anybody? No. No, I'm just keeping in training. Come on, be a good boy, redhead. You've only got a couple of weeks to go. Then it'll be legal for you to start bothering us. Burns, tell me about Anthony Carell. Who? Sometimes called the, uh, the deathless one. Oh, my back. Don't tell me that's going around again. Well, what about him? Ah, that's what I love about this town. No matter how modern it may look on the outside, underneath it's still a jungle. Still dancing the voodoo drums. Voodoo? Yeah, every so often some scared sucker comes in and whispers in our ears that Anthony Carell is still alive and terrifying the countryside. When we ask him for one teeny little bit of proof... The little sucker vanishes in a puff of smoke. Anthony Carell. Oh, redhead, you can do better than that. Yeah, when I got outside on Jackson Street, it did seem kind of silly. But what was so silly about that car trying to run me down last night? What was so silly about Charlie under a white sheet in the basement of that morgue? Oh, I had enough questions in my head to start a quiz show, but not enough answers to win a yo-yo. I knew a good place to ask questions, though. And I had to start asking questions fast. Something was happening, something big, and it was happening to me. I took a cab out to the brownstone house on Wentworth Street where all this began. Come on, you're going to have to open up sometime, baby doll. Ah. Please, go away, Mr. Shane. In a little while, Marina, honey. Please, I'm in mourning. Have some respect. Sure, I'll take off my hat. Inside. What do you want? Why are you so scared? I'm not scared. Tell that to the little nerve in your cheek. It's twitching overtime. Look, I want to know about Anthony Carell. No, please, no. Yes, please, yes. Mr. Shane, I was rather glad when I saw you coming up the stairs. Yeah? Yes, really I was. I've had trouble forgetting you, Michael. Uh-uh, dog girl. Turn off the warm water. I'd love to, but I can't. How about Anthony Carell? Why do you bother with something that does not concern you? That's just it, dog girl. It concerns me clear up to here. Last night, somebody tried to run me down. Later on, they killed an old man who wanted to tell me something. Look, I've been in this business a long time. My nerves are like radar, and they're sending out all kinds of danger signals. I'm on somebody's list. Oh, I'm not one of those storybook detectives, dog girl. I've got to know what I'm fighting. I cannot help you. You've got to. No. Okay. Mind if I use the phone? Who are you calling? The Daily Bulletin. I got a pal working in the city room. I'm going to tell him Marina LaRue of 1612 Wentworth Street says Anthony Carell was responsible for the death of her father. Can't. Bulletin, let me speak to Fraser in the city room. You give me the phone. No. No, you can't do this. They kill me. I'm fighting for my own neck, honey. Hello. Hello, Fraser. This is Mike Shane. Please. Please. Hey, I think I got a story I for you. I tell you what, tell you. Goodbye, Fraser. 
Okay, Dalgo. Give. Give. I tell you. And you go out, try to do something about it, the way men have done for a hundred years. And if they find you at all, they find branded into your flesh the coiled snake. The mark of Anthony Carell. Just as they have found it on all the others. Who is this guy, Anthony Carell? You have heard of Madame Lorette? Madame Lorette? Sure, wasn't she supposed to be some kind of big shot in the voodoo racket around New Orleans? She was the voodoo queen more than a century ago. Yeah? In the 1820s, she married another voodoo worshiper. A man already old. He'd come to New Orleans from Haiti. He was the greatest of them all. His name was Anthony Kael. And this guy who's causing all the trouble today, he's his descendant, huh? Descendant, you fool, don't you understand? It is the same man. But that couldn't be. Why do you think we are all in such terror of him? He cannot die. Do you know what that means? Hey, hey, take it easy. He cannot die. His food has been poisoned. Cars he was riding in have been shot at. Once the house he was staying in was dynamited. Men stood at every door with guns. But in less than a week, the plateaus were dying one by one. And on their forehead, the snake brand of Anthony Kael. That's crazy. That is the story, Mr. Shane. Believe it. Don't believe it as you wish. What does this big shot look like? No living man has ever seen his face. There are no pictures. And who takes care of him? The Carroll clan, one generation after another. Today, there are only two left. One, Philippe. They do Anthony Carroll's work. Collect his tribute. Juan and Philippe. Where do they live? I don't know. I don't know. I've told you everything I know. What else do you want, Mr. Shane? What else do you want? What else do I want? A little while ago, you said you had trouble forgetting me. Well? Come here, doll girl. I don't want you to forget it. After I left Marina, I went to the library and spent half a day looking up the old history books of New Orleans. Madame Lorette and Anthony Carell were in every one, and every book agreed that Madame had died in 1845. There was no mention of Anthony Carell ever having died at all. I called an old guy I knew over at the Bureau of Records. I told him I was looking for the death certificate of one Anthony Carell. He laughed over the phone, asked me if I was falling for that old story. But three hours later, he called me back. Yeah? Shane, this is the Bureau of Records. Well? You were right. There is no death certificate for Anthony Carell. I had a couple of drinks after that. Then I started walking the streets. My head throbbed. Felt like a guy trapped in a nightmare, trying with all his might to wake up out of it. Around midnight, I found a small park near Jackson Square and sat down on a bench trying to think of an answer. May I sit down, Mr. Shane? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, how come you know my name? Oh, you are a very famous man, Mr. Shane. Known particularly for your tenacity. Cigarette? Thanks. What do you want? Mr. Shane, it's very unfortunate that you saw fit to interest yourself in Anthony Carell. Oh? Why? Because now I must kill you. I felt the bullet smash against me. But at first there was so little pain, that same crazy feeling of maybe it's a dream came back. I lunged for the guy trying to get hold of his gun hand. It was like wrestling with an octopus. He was soft and wet-skinned and a neat little fellow. He even wore cologne. It was slipping out of my reach. I jumped up and started running. <laughs> Said the first prayer that came to my mind. Catholic, Hebrew, Episcopalian, who cared? I saw a row of shrubbery had dived in. <laughs> and that bullet had been real all right. My side was beginning to ache like a whole mouthful of sore teeth. My friend with the gun came so close to the brush I could smell his sweet, stinking cologne. I remembered a couple of other prayers and something must have worked. The siren started sobbing the blues far off, and the guy beat it. He climbed into a little black coupe parked at the curb. Pulled away, but he was playing it very safe. There was a long stoplight at the corner, and he waited for every second of it. A nice, law-abiding, perfumed young man. There was a parking lot half a block down the street, and I ran for it. And as I ducked in, I saw the light on the corner change, the black coupe to down Canal Street. I hopped into the first car and turned on the ignition. A sleepy-eyed attendant came out of a little shed, and I kicked the starter. I got your ticket, mister! Hey, come back here! Come back! I wasn't so law-abiding. I went down side streets like somebody lit a fuse. Yeah, just like in the movies, except my, my side hurt, my shirt felt sticky and warm, and I was sick to my stomach. 
When I was sure no cops were following me, I cut back to Canal Street, and pretty soon I saw the black coupe again, still obeying all the laws. Now we're on the outskirts of town, along the wharves that reached out into the gulf. The black coupe picked up speed. I picked up speed. Oh, it was a long ride through little country roads that stretched through the bayous. Once I managed to slip my hand into my shirt and made the happy discovery my wound felt a lot worse than it really was. Yeah, and I had another good break. In the dashboard compartment, I found a pint of bourbon that had hardly been touched. Oh, I touched it good. It was almost as fine as a blood transfusion. And then before I knew it, the black coupe had turned into a driveway. I went on a few hundred yards, pulled up onto some trees and turned the lights off. It was a battered, weather-beaten farmhouse, standing all by itself in the middle of nothing. The windows were boarded up. Everything about it said nobody home except the black coupe. I snuck around the back. The screen door was open. I walked across a porch and almost knocked over a row of milk bottles. I tried the back door. The door was open. Oh, no, I wasn't having any. You didn't have to be a quiz kid to know what this setup was. I started back across the porch. I reached the screen door and then I stopped. The only sound in all the world was a mosquito buzzing like mad in the darkness. Hey, Shane, where are you going? Oh, I... I realized I'd said that out loud. And it giggled to myself. I rubbed my head. It, it was hot. That, that bullet hole. Maybe I was already getting delirious. Yeah. yeah. But where was I going? Back to little New Orleans? For what? The cops wouldn't listen to me. To them, I was just a big-nosed redhead out for a quick buck. And my sweet-smelling friend had slipped up twice now. If I went back to town, he'd come after me again, and he was just about due for the jackpot. Oh. Well, there was no place to go except inside the house. I picked up one of the milk bottles. Me and my homogenized blackjack. I went back to the door. Pushed it open. Went into the kitchen. Everything dark. I could just make out some dishes on the sink. The place smelled of bad, greasy cooking. Then I found another door. Now I was in a short hallway that led to a flight of stairs. Not a sound at all. Oh, I'd even been glad to hear that mosquito. Stairs. Started up a step at a time. Slow. Easy. Slow. Easy. And when I was close to the top, there was something about the darkness that looked wrong. Real close to me, I smelled sweet cologne. I spun around and started down the stairs fast, but it was all wasted. At the foot of the stairs, a cigarette glowed in the dark. I was boxed in real nice. The guy downstairs spoke first. So this is Mr. Shane, Juan. Yes, this is him, Philippe. Juan and Philippe. The brothers Carell. And where is old man Anthony? You have come for Anthony. Well, he is in the last room at the end of the hall, but I don't think you will reach him. I think you are going to die on those stairs. Keep coming up the steps, Mr. Shane. Yeah. Yeah, sure. How's this? Oh, look out! I lunged at him. There was a swirl of cologne. I brought the milk bottle down hard and one crumpled on the floor. Nice as you please. Behind me, I heard Philippe coming up after me. I raced down the hall. I tried the first door. Yeah, locked. The second door. Oh, locked. The third door was unlocked. I opened it and slammed it shut behind me. I snapped the lock. Oh, friend Philippe was at the door breaking through. I did the first thing that came to my mind. I picked up a chair and smashed it through the window. And then I ducked into a corner as the door flung open. Philippe came into the room holding his gun. He headed straight for the broken window. He stood looking out of it into the darkness for a long time. Won't you get away, Mr. Shane? His back was to me. I started for him. My side was throbbing again. My throat was so dry you could have struck matches on it. Something must have warned Philippe. He started turning around. I brought the milk bottle down hard. Uh-huh. He staggered, fell to his knees, got up and started clawing at my legs. I went into a deep purple fog. When I came out of it, Philippe was very quiet. The milk bottle was broken into a thousand pieces. I, I sat down on a chair. I felt about as peppy as a Floridora girl. And then I remembered Anthony Carell, the man who couldn't die, was down the hall. I went over to Philippe and dug around until I found his gun. He groaned a little bit, but that's all. I went back out into the hall. The last room at the end of the hall. I started toward it. 
Then in front of the door, I saw one. I... I will not let you in this room. He wasn't able to stand up. He was on his knees in front of the door, and his mouth hung open as though he didn't have the strength to close it. For five generations, he has been our strength. With him, we've been able to rule everyone. I will not let you destroy him. And then I saw the gun in his hand. I saw him try to raise it. I shot three times. He collapsed in a heap. But even while dying, he wasn't going to let me into that room. As I reached for the knob, with his last strength, Juan flung his arm up and wildly tried to block me. What was there in that room that a guy would die like this just to protect? I reached for the knob and raised my gun. I entered the room, slowly, looked around. Then I realized why Juan and Felipe tried so hard to keep me out of here. Then I realized why Anthony Carell would not die, why he could not be killed. There was no Anthony Carell. The room was empty. Yeah. Yeah, that was the story of Anthony Carell. He'd lived and died in his own time just as any man. But the Carell clan, knowing the power of fear, had made it appear that the old man was still alive and kicking. Oh, I wonder how many people go through life being afraid of empty rooms. Well, as soon as I got back to town that night, I went to the emergency hospital and had myself pasted together. Then I called on Marina LaRue. I told her all about Anthony Carell. When I finished, she didn't say a word. Just came over and looked at me a long time, and she kissed me. After a while, I began to realize that trip to the hospital was wasted. Moreno was so much better than penicillin. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, uh, this episode just did a great job of uh, creating that sense of atmosphere. Uh, very uh, powerfully done. A great job by Jeff Chandler. And this one definitely uh, really does capture the feel of a hard-boiled uh, detective story uh, like you would read in a, in a novel. I think it's safe to say that this may be the most uh, hard-boiled uh, show that we play in terms of how closely it sticks uh, to the way that genre is uh, constructed. All right, well, next week we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Jeff Chandler and more. Uh, be sure and join us for that next week. Coming up tomorrow, uh, it's The Avenger. And uh, in the meanwhile, do send your comments, Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become part 